Welcome to our Thursday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today I'm continuing to teach on how to prepare your heart. Now that title may not grab you, but I promise you the things that I'm talking about are just vital. These are really important things. The direction that your heart goes is the direction that your life will go. And many people are praying for a change in their life and circumstances, the direction they would like things to be different, but they don't change their heart. So this is really important. And I've got this teaching entitled How to Prepare Your Heart. And it's based on 2 Chronicles chapter 12 and verse 14, where it says, talking about King Rehoboam, he did evil because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. And so if you would prepare your heart, which I've spent a lot of time, this is nearly the end of my second week of teaching on this, and tomorrow is going to be my last day to teach on this. But I've already shared a lot of things about preparing your heart means to fix your heart, to establish your heart, to set your heart aright, uh, to focus your heart. It has to be done through humility, God dependence. It says in Psalms chapter 10, verse 17, that the Lord will hear the desire of the humble. He will prepare their heart. So God prepares your heart when you humble yourself and become dependent upon Him and quit doing things your own way. But you run up a white flag, you surrender, and you make Him your Lord. So we've talked about all those things. And then the last couple of days, I was using First Chronicles chapter 29, where David came and gave over $4 billion worth of gold, silver, precious stones, iron, wood, uh, to the building of the temple. It so touched the children of Israel that the people just spontaneously started giving, and they gave over uh, $7 billion worth. So there was probably $11 billion or more that came in in one offering. Then David was so touched by this, he just started glorifying God, saying, God, what have we done? We were nothing. We were sojourners. We were slaves, and now we are a nation of free men, and we have the ability to give all of this gold and says, all we've done is give back to you a small portion of what you've given to us. And I've talked about all of these things. But then yesterday, as we were ending our program, I got down to First Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 18. And it says, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and of Israel, our fathers, keep this forever in the imagination of the thoughts of the heart of thy people and prepare their heart unto thee. In other words, he was praying, God, don't ever let us forget this. Burn this image of what's happened this day into our imagination. And I made a couple of statements yesterday I didn't get time to finish up on. But your imagination is how you remember things. You can't remember anything that you can't see in your imagination. Your imagination is just your ability to see with your heart something that you can't see with your eyes. Like if I say, how do you go someplace? You tell me you go down here and you turn left and then you turn right. You don't, you haven't memorized that. It's not just things in your brain, but you can close your eyes and you can see it. That's your imagination. You know, sometimes when you talk about imagination, people get weird and think, well, that's like Eastern religion. You're talking about visualization. No, I'm not talking about the same thing that, you know, the New Age or Eastern religion does. I'm just talking about that we see things in our mind. If I say dog, you don't see the letters D-O-G. You see a dog. And with most people, it's a dog that you're familiar with, your own dog. Or if you were a child and you had a dog or something, you see it. And I could change your picture, your imagination, with my words. Some of you are picturing a little tiny dog like a chihuahua. I could say it's a big dog like a Great Dane. And immediately, all of a sudden, your picture changes. And I could even be more specific, a big black dog, a big black mean dog. And you could just, with words, you could change the picture. But did you know, if you couldn't picture it, let's say, for instance, some of you have heard me use this illustration. So on you... Um, it might not work right now. But if I say, picture a water blivet, most people draw a blank because you don't know what a water blivet is. You haven't seen one. But see, with my words, I can paint a picture. And I can tell you that in Vietnam, they used to bring these water blivets in. They were in 250, 500, and 1,000, and 1,500 gallon sizes. And what they were, they were rubber cylinders 
and they had brass spigots on the end, and they would hook these things onto a helicopter, and a helicopter would fly these water blivets into our fire support base, and we would go get our water out of it. It was uh, potable water, and we would get our water out of it, and atmospheric pressure would collapse these things as the water drained out, and they'd be flat, and they'd haul them off and bring another one in. Now, that may not give you a total picture, but with my words, now you have some image that you can see in your mind, and because of that, you can remember a water blivet. But if I just use the term water blivet and you don't ever attach it to a picture, you won't be able to remember it. You can't remember something that you can't see. And this is why so many people, when it comes to education, you know, in the Western world, we tend to teach uh, things by memory and we just make people memorize like your addition tables, your multiplication tables. And we just make it by rote that people do things. But a better way of education is to teach people by example. And I've actually had teachers. My mother was a teacher and she was a good teacher. And she, I struggled with math until I was in the sixth grade. And I, it's because I was just trying to memorize these things and especially statement problems where they would give you something. The reason I, I didn't do good with that is because my imagination, I just didn't, couldn't picture these things. I wasn't thinking straight. So anyway, my mother helped me. And I remember her, you know, when it came to things, she would take objects and say, all right, you got one object here. You got one object here. You put these two together. How many does that make? And I began to start seeing the practical application. And because of that, did you know that math actually became my strongest uh, subject, because I had somebody help me to picture it. I could see the application. And, you know, for instance, ratios. Most people think, you know, ratios and algebra and calculus and things like this, what? They don't have a practical application. They're just trying to learn facts and figures. But I use ratios every day of my life. I have these reports that come in that tell us how many calls we've gotten, how many letters we've gotten, how many materials we've sent out, how many partners have come in, how much money's come in, and all of these things. And if it's, you know, here's an easy ratio. If it's the 15th of the month and we have $2 million worth of income, well, then that's half of a month. So we could project that we're going to probably get around $4 million worth of income if we had $2 million on a half of a month. You know what that is? That's math. That's a ratio. And it's, a, it's got a practical application, and I use this every day of my life. But if it's the third day of the month, did you know all you have to do is figure in an average month there's 30 days, and so that's basically one-tenth of a month. And so you just figure that whatever income you've got, well, however many calls, however many requests for products or whatever, you're going to have approximately 10 times that much by the time the month is up. And what that is, that's ratio. So there's a lot of people that when it comes to math, they don't have any application. They can't see a practical application of it. It's just facts and figures, and because of it, they struggle with it. If you can picture something, when you are teaching something, if you can picture it, that's how you retain it. You know, even as a kid, like I said, my mother helped me learn this, but I remember studying the Bible after the Lord had touched my life. I was like 18 or 19, and I remember studying about David killing Goliath. And I literally went out, I studied in a, a concordance or in a commentary. Most people believe Goliath was somewhere between nine and 10 feet tall. So they, the one I was reading said nine foot six. I went out on a tree in our yard and I measured nine foot six and put a marker. And then I stood there in front of that and I tried to picture, imagine what Goliath looked like. And some people would think, well, that's silly. Why would you do that? Because if you can see it, if you can picture it, it becomes real to you. You can understand it. You can remember it. So I tried to picture what David was seeing. I actually bent down some because most people believe David was only around five foot tall. And so I bent down some so that I could get the perspective. When I went to Israel, I actually went to the Valley of Elah where David fought Goliath. And it was a hot day. The bus stopped. The bus driver said, this is the valley. Here's the little dry creek bed where David got the five smooth stones. Does anybody want to get out? And it was a hot day. 
And you could see there was nothing there. There was nothing built there. And uh, people could see it from the bus. And so everybody said, no, we just want to stay here. I said, I want to get out. And I walked out and I walked down to that dry creek bread. I got me five little stones that I held in my hand. And I sat there and I looked round about and imagined what it would have been like for David to see Philistines all over these mountains and then this huge giant. And did you know, because I went there and I used my imagination and I could see those things, my imagination just came alive. And the story of David slaying Goliath is something that God has spoken to me and has blessed me with. It has been awesome, but it's because I've engaged my imagination. So I'm saying all of these things that your imagination is a part of you preparing your heart. You have to get to where you don't just sit here and have a concept of, oh, I want to live for the Lord. But you need to see yourself living for the Lord. You don't have to just sit there and say, I don't ever want to go out and get drunk. I never want to do that. I want to live for God. But you have to see yourself. You have to engage to the point that you can see these things happening. You know, let me use another passage of Scripture over here in Psalms chapter 1. It says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Notice, it says you have to meditate in the law day and night. And the word that it was translated meditate in that second verse is the exact same Hebrew word that is translated imagine in chapter 2, verse 1. Chapter 2, verse 1 says, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? This exact same Hebrew word that was translated meditate in Psalms 1, 2 was translated imagine in Psalms 2, 1. So by seeing this, you can see that when you are meditating on something, you're imagining. And far too often people just read the Bible like this and they're cramming information into them, which that's a part of the process. You cannot meditate on something that you haven't already heard or had the thought come to you or you've been given the information. So it's important to read. I'm not minimizing that. But far too many people just read and store information and facts in their mind, but they, it doesn't ever change their imagination. For instance, you can quote that by his stripes we are healed. But have you ever taken that and, and taken those truths and just sat down and meditated on it until you saw yourself well? See, there's a lot of people that have the information. They could even quote a scripture, but they have never seen themselves well. You have to see yourself well. And when it comes to talking about preparing your heart, you have to see yourself serving God. You have to see yourself differently. I was just talking to a woman yesterday who came to school, and even after she was in Bible school for over a year, she was still going out on weekends and getting drunk and doing things. Now, she was changing, and things were changing, but it wasn't changed yet. And I was just amazed as I talked to her about all of this and I said, what was the real difference? And she said, when she finally understood spirit, soul, and body is what I call my teaching on that, about who you are in Christ, about how you're changed on the inside. She said, when she saw that and she saw herself differently, she saw herself in right standing with God. She saw herself as a person who is now holy and pure in their heart. When she changed the way she saw herself, then the actions changed. She no longer needed to get drunk. She no longer needed to escape. She wasn't displeased with herself. There, were, there was things in her physical realm that she might have wanted to change, but she saw who she was in the Spirit, in Christ. And because of that, it became a self-fulfilling prophecy. She saw herself as free. She saw herself as having power over these things. And because of it, she was able to go out and live it. This is the way you got to prepare your heart. You've got to take these truths and the way that God wants us to live. And you've got to see yourself being that way. Man, I just pray that God is helping you to get... I, I've got a lot of teaching on this. I could literally teach for weeks and I'm limiting it to just a couple of days. And you're going to have to... You're going to have to get the product to be able to get the fulfillment of all of this, the fullness of it. 
But I tell you, this is so important that you cannot consistently go this direction if your thoughts and your image is going this direction. The way that you see things is the way that your life will go. There are some of you, and I'm saying these things to help you, not to condemn anybody, but there are some of you that because of failures, because of mistakes that have been made, maybe even things done to you, you see yourself as a failure. And you see yourself as an evil person. And I'm not saying that you haven't done things that aren't evil. You may have done very bad things. But if you call out to God, God puts a new heart on the inside of you. And if you're born again, your life is not what your actions are. Your actions are a result of the way you see yourself. Proverbs 23, 7, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. There are some people who've been born again. If you were to die right now, you would go directly into the presence of God. God has forgiven you. And yet you're living a life of alcoholism, drug addiction, sexual immorality, failure in your business, failure in your marriage or whatever. And you see yourself as a failure. You see yourself as a victim. You see yourself unable to overcome these things. And because of it, you aren't able to overcome it. You really do have the power on the inside of you, but you don't see it. You don't see that. You know yourself by the way you look in the mirror, by your past experiences. You don't see who you are in Christ. We had a woman come to our Bible school, and this woman was from Nigeria. And in Nigeria, they had a lot of demonic manifestations. I mean, clearly people who were demon-possessed. And uh, there was a lot of witchcraft and stuff. And because of all of this, she had an inflated opinion of the devil and she actually saw the devil as being superior in power and authority to her. So when she first came to school, she couldn't sleep at night. She was tormented with some things. And yeah, I believe it was demonic. I believe Satan was tormenting her. So it wasn't like this was psychosomatic. I believe it was actually an attack from the devil. And she wanted me to come and just cast these devils out. And I said, but you know, the problem is you see yourself as inferior to the devil. You think he's got more power than you do. Now, intellectually, she had heard that we have authority over the devil. She could have probably quoted some of those scriptures, but as far as practical things, she saw herself inferior to the devil. And so I said, I'm not going to pray for you. I said, you need to change the image on the inside. You need to find out who you are. And I sent her to my teaching on the believer's authority. And anyway, with I forget the exact period of time, but within six months' time, this woman came to me and she was totally free, not because I prayed for her, but because she saw the power and the authority. She saw herself differently. She recognized that she was the one that had power. Satan couldn't do anything to her without, his, without her consent and cooperation. She changed the image on the inside and like that, Satan was gone. And not only in her life, but her husband, who was still back in Nigeria, he was dying, I think, of a cancer or something like this. And because she became to this new revelation, she took her authority and rebuked and commanded, and he was healed. And their relatives and friends at the church in Nigeria and just all kinds of things happened. There was a ripple effect just because she changed the way that she saw herself. There are many of you that know that the Bible says we're more than a conqueror, but you see yourself as a victim. And again, our society loves to make victims out of people. We love to tell people, oh, the reason you are the way you are is because the government hasn't helped you. It's their fault. And what you need to do is you need to go out and you need to kill cops because they're oppressing you and it's them that has held you back. And there's people that have this stuff crammed down there, uh, you know, crammed in them, and they think that they are justified, that they're the victim and stuff, and that is wrong. That is wrong, wrong, wrong. And we've got these things and people are being, they're embracing this victim mentality. It's impossible for you to be a victor and a victim at the same time. Those are opposite directions. For Before you can start being a victor, you got to get rid of this victim mentality and recognize that with God, through God, I can do all things. Through Christ, I can do all things. Uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. And you've got to see yourself as capable to do things. You've got to see yourself able, not in just your physical flesh. 
Man, the things I'm saying, there are just so many things I'd love to say. There's so many wrong conceptions about I mentioned this earlier about a man in Australia who said, I'm not up to the job. I can't run the ministry. I can't run the Bible school. And I said, that's a great attitude as long as you don't stop there with what you can't do. And if you go beyond that to find out that through Christ, I can do all things. I said, that's a great attitude. And sure enough, he has run just a great job and he's doing a tremendous job because he has gone beyond himself. But see, he has to see himself in Christ. Now, in his flesh, he may not be able to do these things, but through Christ, he can do all things through Christ. And you have to see this. And this is your imagination. And this is what David is praying. And he says, God, keep this in the imagination of the thoughts of their heart and prepare their heart unto thee. When you start using your imagination in a godly way and you see yourself serving God and you see yourself that I am a child of God, I'm not an old sinner. You know, this is one of the things that graded on me that I was raised in a denomination that didn't, I, they taught you how to get saved, but they didn't teach you how to live saved. They taught you to just get saved and then stuck until you go to be with the Lord. And one of their favorite sayings was, I'm an old sinner saved by grace. Now see what that does. That gives your identity as being an old sinner. You're forgiven, but you're still an old sinner. No, that's not an accurate description. I was an old sinner, but now I'm saved by grace and I am the righteousness of God. Does that mean that I never do anything wrong? No, I still sin. I still fall short of what I'm supposed to be, but that is not who I am. I am the righteousness of God. I am forgiven. I am a new creature. And when you begin to see yourself that way, it changes the way you react to things. If you think I'm an old sinner saved by grace, well, then temptation may come and you might give it token resistance. But after a short period of time, you just give in because after all, that's who you are. You're an old sinner. You were a drunk and you're still a drunk. You're just a forgiven drunk. And so if that's who you see yourself to be, you're going to wind up going back into that. But if you could understand, no, I'm in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. I am a new creature. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. Then when the temptation to drink comes back, you'll say, nope, I'm a new person. When the temptation to come back and steal and to get depressed and go through all the things you used to do before you got born again, you'll say, no, I'm a new person. But see, that's your imagination. You have to see yourself differently. And when you do that, that changes your heart. Your heart is going to go the direction of the way you see things going. If you see yourself being a failure, it'll become a self-fulfilling prophecy. I'm out of time today, but I am going to finish this series tomorrow. And I tell you, this series right here, How to Prepare Your Heart, could be a real blessing to you. 